In many animals, legs are the ones that support their entire weight. In some animals, their tail can help in supporting their weight. For example, when monitor lizards are tripoding, they use their tail to help them stand up. In extreme case, i.e. the red kangaroos, many individuals' tail can even support their weight, especially when landing a kick or punch. Which is why, although things like Mimifida or Gawky from Monster Hunter Wilds don't exist in our world, the concept is not outrageous. However, what if an animal's nose is so big and long that it can't even support their entire weight? Wouldn't that be, well, shocking to say the least? So, let me bring up the question. What exactly is Rhinogradentia? Okay, before we delve deeper, just let me clarify this one important thing. These creatures are made up. They are not real creature. You can read about them in the book called Bau und Leben der Rhinogradentia. This title basically translates into form and life of Rhinogradentia. This book was written by Harald Stumke, which was the pseudonym used by Gerolf Steiner, which is an actual zoologist from German. So, according to this book, there was an archipelago called Haiyi, or at least I think that's how you pronounce it. In these small islands, there exist some unique creatures. The most striking of them all are the Rhinograts, scientifically assigned to the order Rhinogradentia. This archipelago was destroyed by nuclear weapons testing by the US military. Again, just to be clear, this premise is made up. Anyway, what's amazing about this book is, it is written in a very scientific, zoologic way. I mean, of course, the author is an actual zoologist after all. But if you think about it, dedicating yourself to make up an entire order of animals with such detail amidst your academic life is, well, what something if I do say so myself. Oh, by the way, I think with the latest update, there are 189 species of rhinograts, with more than 30 genera belonging to 14 different families, which belong to different tribes and suborder. So yes, when I say it is written in a zoologic way, it is indeed written in a zoologic way. By the way, that one book is not the only book that you can read if you want to read about them. There is a French one called... Um... I'm 100% sure I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation, so I'm just gonna show you. There is also an English translated one called The Snouters, Form and Life of the Rhinograts. Okay, so what exactly is Rhinograts? Well, they are shrew-like mammals, with one striking trait that differentiates them from other mammals, the Nasarium. Nasarium is basically a modified nose. In most Rhinograts, the Nasarium is used for locomotion. Rhinogradentia basically means those who walk with their nose after all, or to put it simply, the nose walkers. However, in some genera, it is used for something else, which I'll show you later of course. So. Let's take a look at these creatures, but before that... First, let's take a look at the one which is considered to be the most basal, the Heckel's primitive snouter. They are considered primitive because they still walk on four legs and their nose is just... well, a big nose I guess. It is big and strong enough to support their weight though, which is displayed when they are eating. For whatever reason. Next, there is this one with a hard tail that resembles a shell. I believe conch cauda means conch tail, which is self-explanatory of course. They could bend their tail ventrally to conceal themselves like this. Then, there is emungtator, the snuffler, which can blow a long sticky thread from their nasarium to, well, fish basically. They also have toxin gland on the tip of their tail to defend themselves. A possible close relative to the snuffler is the honey tails, Dulci cauda. They have a pillar-like nasarium and they are mostly sedentary. They attract insects with their sweet-smelling secretion produced by the gland on their tail, and then stab the insect with their bark. Next, also their relative, the pillar nose snouter. Their tail is short, hence they couldn't deploy the same strategy as their presumed relatives. Instead, they rely on another species of snouters to feed them, specifically the snout leaper. In exchange for feeding them, 
the pillar nose snouter provide milks for the snout leaper, which is quite an interesting form of symbiosis if I do say so myself. Moving on to another subtribe, the mud snouters. These are mostly subterranean creatures. Starting from the most straightforward one, the ribbon snouters, Rhinotyenia. These live in muds and feed on worms and insect larvae with their proboscis like mouth. Their long nasarium are used to breathe the left nostril for inhalation, while the right one for exhalation. There's also a species which live inside a giant muscle as a parasite, which is why they are shaped like this. Another family in the subtribe, the trumpet snouters, which live in water body. Rhinostentor submersus are submerged, while their trumpet-like nasarium both function as airway to breathe and buoy at the same time. They also have thick bristles on their sides to filter food. Another one in the same genus, Rhinostentor foetidus, floats and creeps around with their nasarium. Their collecting apparatus is rake-like instead of bristling net. Another subtribe, the burrowing snouters. This one burrows in the ground. For example, the mole snouters, Rhinotalpa. They have a nasal erectile organ which is used to move. They inflate their snout which causes the wreath to extend and creates friction with the soil and then they blow air out of their snout to pull themselves forward. And then there is the whole snouters, holorinids, which is mostly snout as is indicated by their name. Here is an image depicting the evolutionary transition from Rhinotalpa to the holorinids. Oh, by the way, these numbers indicate the amount of their internal organs. Having only two internal organs is definitely quite something. Next is Probably the most famous rhinograts, the snout leapers. The Hopser rhinus is probably the most depicted rhinograts that you may randomly see on the internet. They are also the most abundant rhinograts. They use their nasarium to leap. This one can digest normally, while the Mercatorinus, which have a symbiotic relationship with the column defects that I talked about earlier, cannot. Mercatorinus need to suckle on column defects to live. Moving on to another genus, Autopteryx, the earwing. This one is very similar to the Hopsorinus, but they have a really big ear, which they can use to fly. And then there is also the leaf leaper, which belongs in its own family. Their snout and tail are both muscular and can be used for locomotion, which is why their family is called the two-way snout leapers. They are arboreal compared to the regular snout leapers, which live on the ground. Belonging to a different family, yet still related, is the orchid snouter, Orchidiopsis. These ones stand with their tail. Their flattened snout resembles flowers' accessory and can secrete vanilla-smelling odor to attract insects. Supported by their ear and a dermal comb on their head, they mimic orchid, hence the name. Alright, so, those are all the simple snouters, aka the unisnouter those with only one nasarium. Oh yes, they do get more complicated. Let's take a look at the multi-snouter, suborder Polyrena, starting with the four snouters. If it's not obvious enough, these have four snouts. What you are looking at is the snout walkers. If Hoplorinus leap with their snout, these ones walk with their snout, hence the name. Just like how you might have already imagined, they move these snouts alternatingly to walk. Their tail is also specialized. This ribbon-like tail is used to pick and hold fruits. So yeah, these ones are peaceful and chill. Unlucky for them, they have a natural predator, which by the way, is also a renegade, the predaceous snouters, Tyrannonasus imperator. Instead of a ribbon-like tail, they have stingers instead. This stinger is a poison claw, by the way, as always, the predators need to be weaponized, because of course they do, right? Another nice detail about them is the fact that they cannot help but make whistling noise when they walk. This applies to all four snouters, by the way, including the snout walkers. I mean, understandable because they walk with their nose after all. Because they can't help but make noises, they can't simply chase after their prey. And also, they are not quick. So, they need to stalk their prey patiently and ambush them. Oh, by the way, Imperator generally means Emperor, because of course, 
the predator needs to be given a cool and strong name. And yeah, those two are the four snouters. Next, let's take a look at the six snouters, which, if it's not obvious enough, have six snouts. First, let's take a look at the equal snouted snouters. Familia isorinidae. Their snouts are equally sized. Elodonopsis usually stays inside the holes. They extend their ribbon-like snouts to trap insects, which will then be swept into their mouth. Another genus, Hexanthus, also starts by living in holes like Elodonopsis. However, as they mature, their snouts elongate and resemble a flowering plant. They extend these snouts among real flowering plants and catch flying insects that are attracted to flowers. Oh, by the way, the species name is written as Ranunculonasus pulcher in this image, but it is synonymous to Hexanthus ranunculonasus. You know, junior synonymy before being revised. That's a common thing to occur in taxonomy. Anyway, on the opposite end of the spectrum is the Cephalonthus, synonymous with Corbulonasus. In their case, their face resembles flower. Their six snouts resemble flower petals. They have a very long and stiff tail which resembles a plant stalk. So yeah, they also mimic flowers, but like I said, on the opposite end. Moving on to the other family, the Anisorinidae, which is the unequal snouted snouters. There is only one genus and one species in this family, which is the shaggy-faced snouters, mammontops. They have four snouts which support their weight just like the four snouters. However, they also have two other snouts which are used to grasp things. Basically, imagine a woolly mammoth, but their legs are their snouts? Okay, that's probably a really weird analogy. Alright, the last group, the tassel snouters. This one is quite confusing to look at. Basically, they have a long rostrum, and each of these rows are their snouts. Looking at this model should help you understand how they look. Think of their snouts as tentacles. Some functions as sensory organs, while some can be used to grab. This species is called Rhinochilopus musicus because this part of their head can serve as musical organ, literally, like a pipe organ, hence why they are called pipe organ tassel snouter. And yeah, that's most of them, generally speaking at least. There are some species that are listed but not illustrated, which you could most likely find some fan-made illustrations or models if you google it. Of course, what I talk about in this video is basically just the general information. There are more details written in the book, so go check it out if you are interested. Maybe you'll see something that you like. Personally, I don't really have a favorite because their form is just not my thing. But if I have to choose, I guess my favorite would be the Reno Stentor because, well, they look weird enough while not looking like something out of an eldritch horror, I guess. If this is your first exposure to the Reno grades, then let me know what you think about them. Do you find them cool, weird, or perhaps gruesome? But yeah, that's all for now. Oh, by the way, while I don't really enjoy making up creatures myself, I do enjoy looking at people's creatures. I know some of you in the Discord server likes doing that, so yeah, keep on keeping on. Anyway, enjoy your day.